Hey, Brass Facts here. The offensive handgun concept. Better put by its non-cringe fluencer naming scheme, the idea of bringing the most capable handgun to the fight as concealably possible, including sacrificing reliability. On, on, on the day where a pistol is my primary, I want a, the pistol that has the highest degree of performance and mechanical advantage in that fight. You know, it's pretty simple. Oh, yeah, uh, speaking of which, since we're talking about the offensive handgun, brought this guy in, you may have heard of him, Chuck Pressford. Yeah, dude has a resume that's longer than the script of this video. Guy's been there, guy's done that, and then he went back for seconds and thirds. So he's a lot of experience uh, in the tactical sphere, and a lot of his focus has been on the handgun. And obviously, he's the, you know, he's the Roland Special dude. He's the guy that made the Roland Special. So he seemed like a pretty good fit for this video. Let's backtrack a bit here. About three months ago, I made a video on the Roland Special, which kind of kicked all of this off, and then recently I made the Boltac 2 review. The question that came up in both of these, mostly for me, because I bullied myself relentlessly during the script-making process with constant devil advocate moments, was why? Why am I advocating and carrying a gun with some shooting performance increase at the expense of reliability, significantly increased weight, size, bulk, and an eye-watering price tag? Obviously the answer is it's a gun that shoots better at the expense of size, weight, cost, and reliability. R roll credits. Due to my crippling autism, however, I have trouble taking this stuff at face value. Yes, we get better performance, but why does any of that matter here when this Glock 43X is absolutely capable of getting her done, at least statistically speaking? That brings us into a really important point. I'll be making this a couple times during the video, but I want to be very sure that the viewer, well, you, don't kind of view this video as a policy prescription. You don't have to go out and now go buy a 2011 to roll in special or whatever. Stick to what you got. This is just kind of a study, gun talk, ramblings of a crazed man on the internet that doesn't know how to shut up about why you may want to do something like this. We're gonna take a notable detour for a second and look rearward. What exactly is an offensive handgun physically and how did we get to that point? This video is sponsored by Nightline. Nightline is all about providing night vision to you at an affordable cost with the peace of mind of having an individual that can help you throughout the process, including picking out tubes. Simply pick out a tube on their website, call them up, and they'll handle the rest. A real standout from Nightline is their NL914. This is a variation of the PVS-14, shares most of the same dimensions and design, but importantly uses a unique housing that takes both AA's and CR123's. This might sound like a gimmick, but when you're in the field having the ability to access multiple battery types, especially the lithium CR123 that is very ubiquitous in tactical gear, makes for a much more robust logistical chain. Just the other night, I was doing a night rock shoot and more, and all of my AA batteries were depleting and kind of shitting the bed, so I popped in some spare CR123s that I had lying around for my flashlights and got back in it. And then I probably dropped the PBS-14 off a rock, but that's neither here nor there. Regardless, go check out Nightline the next time you're interested in buying night vision and tell them Brass Facts sent you for a whopping 15% off. The origin of the name, the civilian offensive handgun, is derived from the original sort of offensive handgun concept, the Mark 23 from HK. Born out of the desire to give operators as much firepower as possible without crossing into the realm of rifle due to size and sound signature issues. The concept of trading capability for size, weight, and more is not a new one. Remember, we used to start out and we carried G19 size guns, which themselves were smaller variants of the original duty size weapon. We then very quickly decided those were kind of a pain in the ass to carry, likely because holster design back then was kind of shit. So the market was flooded with the smallest handguns possible, the Ruger LCP being a crowd favorite and probably the go-to concealed carry option back then. That thing is smaller than most wallets. Unfortunately, the prospect of shooting one of these is so grueling, I'd rather just shoot myself in the face than endure emptying the entire 6 plus 1 magazine. And that's where the first issue lies. These things are pocket swords with extra steps. Very few people can run these with any speed and accuracy. But uh, while well, I had a 42 and I carried it as an ankle gun, I basically looked at it like a fighting tool, not a firearm. Like, don't, I didn't want to convince myself that I was carrying a tool that had the same performance, you know, as a as a real gun. It's a step above being unarmed and it's a step below EDC. So if I put this on, I'm not really EDC carrying. I'm carrying this other thing, but I'm not really EDC carrying because 
I can't do the things with this that I can do with a gun that's just a little bit bigger than this. I more envisioned uh, using that 42 um, as a for uh, contact gunshots. So basically, the, you know, the the 42 on my ankle was like carrying a folding blade knife for entangled close ground and pound stuff. You know, jam that thing under somebody's uh, jaw and volcano their head or whatever. So the pendulum swings back once again. Some went back to full-size guns. Some bought hybrid compact variants of said guns, like a G26 or a VP9SK. And some obviously stuck with Arthritis Generator 9000. That was the deal. You could have shootability, capacity, and 9mm, or you could have small and 380. The first real shift in the industry came with the SIG 365. And then later, handguns like the Hellcat or the Glock 43X with shield arms magazines. Suddenly, we had handguns that were significantly smaller than duty size handguns, but matched, or hilariously in some cases, actually exceeded the capacity of their double stack counterparts. This 43X, for example, is single stack sized, and yet carries the exact same round count as this G19 here. It even has an optic on it. Now, the question no longer was 380 versus 9mm, capacity versus size, it was shootability versus concealability. But there's still one more thing to trade in this dynamic. Let's talk about the Roland Special. It took a stock G19, strapped a weapon-mounted light to the thing, on par with most rifle-mounted lights at the time, an aftermarket precision barrel, red dot sights, and a honkin' compensator. All these features married together to create something special. A Roland Spot, while these seem very pedestrian nowadays, that was quite revolutionary and, of course, controversial at the time. The compensator, which kind of makes the gun as iconic as it is, allowed the handgun to shoot significantly flatter than any other duty gun on the market. That in conjunction with a red dot sight, an experienced shooter was beginning to tickle the balls of an intermediate level shooter with his sub 1000 yard rifle performance with a handgun. Nothing comes for free though, and in addition to being one of the most expensive ways to play tactical Barbie, it also breaks one of the cardinal rules, reliability. While I'd argue the Roland Special isn't technically unreliable, it's just picky, we're gonna lump it all into a single category. It's, yeah, it, yeah it, it's finicky, and you are, uh, even if you buy an ammo that make it run, the fact that a 115 will choke in the gun and a, and a full power 124 tells you that it needs more ass to run. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that I tells, you, that it, tells you everything you need to know right there, you know? Mm -hmm. The setup was really more tuned around or set up around running 147 duty loads and the best FMJ ever conceived by man. It requires a weaker aftermarket spring assembly, which tends to wear out faster, and the gun itself is already pretty finicky on what it's able to deal with. The RMR Type 1, so the original RMRs, while super durable for blunt impacts, get their shit pushed in by pistol recoil. Once you check those boxes, yeah, the gun, the gun runs great, runs really well. I've had one for about 11,000 rounds. If you want details of how the Roland Special was extremely ahead of its time, go ahead and watch this here video. It's really the progenitor to the offensive handgun concept in the civilian space, and also really kind of normalized a lot of things that we take for granted nowadays. As awesome as the Roland Special is, it's kind of a terrible flagship for the offensive handgun concept. It never really sold as a complete package, and it comes with a lot of jank. And let's be real, it still used a Glock trigger. Thus enters the 2011. A 1911 in 9mm with the capacity on par with all the other double stack Tupperware wonders, with the only downside by comparison being the need to liquidate your kids' college funds on the magazines alone. While the 2011 absolutely had a really rocky start, I'd argue there was no such thing as a usable 2011 that wasn't custom until STI, now Staccato, hit their stride with their 2011s, which is where the name 2011 actually comes from. Modern 2011s in current year check all of the boxes of an offensive handgun, being significantly easier to shoot due to decreased recoil, a trigger that rivals most AR-15s, and a fairly accurate out-of-the-box experience. The proof is in the pudding. I spent six months with a 2011, I spent the last 10 years with a Glock, though admittedly only about the last three of that being me, like kind of pushing my skill level. On the first range trip with a 2011, I brought my splits down from 0.25 to around 0.2 on build drill style targets, and on running gun drills, I was shooting further, more consistently, with higher accuracy and reduced overall shot time. On the first day, while the higher bore axis and grip angle did represent a challenge, I was able to overcome that and still succeed. By about 1500 rounds, all of those kinks were ironed out and I was noticing significant improvement. One of my favorite drills is engaging a 50 yard reduced IPSC with three shots. 
It really requires all the fundamentals to be working together. Any loss in grip, recall management trigger is going to result in obvious downrange embarrassments and lost bets. Like I said, 10 years with the Glock, probably three years of using that drill as a standard. The 2011 in six months had me reconsider if I should just move the target back to 75 yards. Like with everything, this causes the monkey pole to curl a finger. While the Roland Special was generally striker gun reliable, if you fed it the correct ammo, 2011s are very much the inverse of this. 2011s work very well across a wide range of ammo, at least I've noticed, but unlike the Roland, these guns universally are very vulnerable to dirt. You get any dirt into the action, they're gonna begin chugging or outright refusing to run. For the demographic that shoots a lot and thus is benefited by running 2011s as a tool and not a collectible, you will run into issues where you cannot both train and carry the same gun without a brutally annoying cleaning regiment. They're not unreliable per se, they're just not on the same tier as striker fire handguns, not even close. I wanna be sure, uh, I'm spending a lot of times talking about the 2011 as I think it's the quintessential example of this concept, but there are actually a bunch of other choices that don't go too hard in the concept or maybe do or don't, right? Different flavors, different strokes, you name it. Okay, so we have our Gucci offensive handgun. Now what? Aren't we fundamentally still shooting the same bullet out of the same barrel length as a regular run-of-the-mill MMP 2.0? Well, yes, but that gets us to the fundamental brutal reality of handguns. They all suck. So while a lot of times we can rely on the fact that shooting other humans with guns tends to have them just give up on the spot, we need to contend ourselves with the fact that what if they don't? The guy had been shot in the double digits somewhere like 15, 21 times, something like that, uh, with police gunfire. And the guy lived and he was going to, to trial. Or My buddy was talking to the guy and was like, hey man, You'd be willing to like kind of give us an AAR on what it felt like to to get in a running gunfight with the police where you got shot like you know almost twenty times. You know when he had when he had walked out walked out of his his crib that day he had said you know I'm not going back to jail today like like most career criminals. And so he's laying there and he's like, well you're not dead like you know this being shot shit is not nearly as bad as 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 you thought it would be like. Can you get your legs up on you? Yeah. Can you get up? Yeah. Do you want to go to jail? No. Fucking run. And the dude talked himself out of being shot to the ground. Like he did a little status check. He's laying there and he's like, yeah, fucking T the T-800 robot rebooted and, and the criminal was off to the races to not go back to jail today. And each wave of gunfire that would hit him after that did not have as much enchantment over him like it was just like yeah bullets whatever in this specific scenario this was one dude against the task force of cops give this guy a gun even the odds a little bit and that's a terrifying prospect a dude that just munches bullets for breakfast and keeps on going if you're pop if you're popping that high alpha charlie uh you're punching him through the lungs and a gunshot wound to the lung that becomes goes into a pneumothorax with tension that could be a 30 minute problem. I'm a big believer in shot placement. If you've got a very, you know, kind of determined uh, adversary or adversaries uh, where you don't think that they're going to give up very easily, they're committed, uh, angry, pissed off, whatever, and they are going to, they're going to stay in the fight and, and stay coming at you, then you have no choice at that point but to, for, to look for some type of physiological stop. So you've you've got to you've got to get them to leak out. You've got to hit them in the CNS and flip their switch off because if left to their own devices, they're going to take the stimulus that you're gunfighting with them and they're going to throw it right out of the window with with not a care in the world. You know, there are countless anecdotes of cops, civilians, and military getting into gunfights, unleashing hate at .15 splits into the other dude, shits exploding everywhere, Hollywood style. And then a small part of the back of the dude's brain, or actually it's probably the front of the dude's brain, whatever, says, hey, homie's not dying. And then they slow down ever so slightly. You hear the matrix boom, kick on and the guy shoots one well-aimed, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.7 second shot into the CNS or T-zone and ends the fight right there. And that single shot was worth a lot more than the last 10 A-zone hits combined. If you were going to, if you were going to, you know, storm the the really scary castle keep full of armed guards, and you had to carry only a handgun. 
how would you stack those odds of going up against dudes wearing plate carriers and carrying rifles and, and helmets with only a pistol? What pistol would you carry? That's that that's where you start going down the offensive handgun roll. In 2015, a bunch of dudes with AKs unleashed terror and hate on the unsuspecting city of Paris. If you were inserted in that moment, hypothetically, assuming you would be willing to draw a line at the stand and stand your ground, would you be able to handle not just one armed assailant, but multiple? Are all armed with rifles? Probably not. But often the moment chooses us and you need to step up to the plate, especially if you have loved ones or friends around you. What about that moment? Well, within the shouting range of my house, a gunman with a handgun and shotgun shot up a local mall, where an off-duty cop was the first to respond and had to trade rounds with the much more capable weapon. Tragically, there are countless cases like this, where someone with a handgun, a concealed handgun, has to step up to the plate and engage someone with a far more sophisticated or capable weapon. And this is what the civilian offensive handgun is for. We admit to ourselves that we can only bring what we can conceal on our person, because that's life. No one chooses to walk into one of these events. You go to the war with the handgun you have, not the rifle at home or in the car that you want. I think it's easy in this day and age to fall into the expectation of the averages, three seconds, three shots, three yards. To view the biggest threat you will ever potentially face as another dude with a handgun with likely far less training than you. And that's not completely unreasonable. But for those that don't live in the realm of averages, for those that want a higher expectation of performance, and not just the psychological stop, but the ability to say in definitive terms if a gunfight were to ever happen, to say, I'm ending this fight right now and you do not get a vote. The ability to square up to those with shotguns, rifles, armor, and maybe even all of the above with a handgun as the fight potentially progresses into the deep double-digit ranges, that is the domain of the offensive handgun. Now this might sound like American bravado, the part of the human brain that says, yes, I can totally land this fully laden 747, even if both pilots are dead, even though I've only ever flown a plane for 40 minutes on Microsoft Flight Simulator. But I'd argue there's something to be said, looking at all the tragedy in the world, these mass shootings, terrorist events, and instead of resigning yourself to the luck of the draw to hope to never have to deal with an extraordinary event, instead saying, if this ever happens to me, I will not go quietly, and putting up the best fight you can given your skill and the handgun at your side. Speaking of which, that brings us to our final aspect, skill. These handguns do bring a lot to the table, but none of it really matters if you don't have the ability to manifest this latent potential. To make not just the shot when you need to, but since we are civilians and accountable for every single one of our shots, to not make the shot if you don't have the ability to take it. Fortunately for us, one of these people in this video, wonder who, happens to have the skill set and the ability to train you to achieve this. Chuck Presper teaches several classes, most iconic of which is No Fail Pistol. I built No Fail Pistol out um, because I was teaching tactical things at the time. Cops that could exercise their uh, individual skill set uh, in isolation or in training on a flat range, but when you stacked the cognitive load of uh, now team tactics, uh, sectors of fire, uh, target discrimination, or whatever. Then, then um, their decision making fell apart, and and so it's the POI is set up to be a mirror to show you if you think that you have this judgment thing where you run fast and burn it down all the time, and then when you see targets of high difficulty, you just throttle it back and you tighten everything up and you uh, thread the needle and you make your hit and you go right back to shooting loose and shit. Uh, mo most of most people do not. Most people do not possess the judgment or maturity to throttle or modulate the pace at which they are prosecuting a stage um, and then modify it uh, in real time uh, if their skill set isn't high enough. So no fill pistol deep dives uh, your ability to insert the human back into the loop if your hard skills are not as hardwired if you wanted as you wanted them to be. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a two day class. Uh, I'm breaking it out into a three day POI this year, which I'll, I'll be beta testing it this year, where it'll be a two day and then there'll be a one day, um, kind of more fun. Uh, I see I've seen some dudes shoot pretty fast in no fill pistol as well, but uh, it is about identifying what 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 it looks like and what it feels like when your gun is not ready to fire.
And so the answers to the test are in front of your face. And until you fire the gun, you have a chance to to change your behavior if you want to. Um, and so, yeah, if you're uh, predictably shooting and the stars and the moon aren't lining up because you're unpracticed, because you haven't done your dry fire, because you haven't committed to regular range practices, like you can you can kick yourself in the butt after the gunfight about why you let yourself go with your proficiency but you still have a gunfight that you have to survive and hopefully you have to survive it with the minimal amount of collateral damage so the sooner that you can change your behavior and stop shooting like a petulant child and sprinkling your bullets all over section 8 housing probably the better off you you know better your chances are that you're going to go home that night um safe and sound Nova doesn't get hold. Uh, you know you're supposed to flip her over, right? No, she hates it. Ro rotate. Are you sure rotate. rotate. I feel like she's gonna rotate. Right rotate. Rotate. Again. No, yeah, she's um, not. Uh, rotate. I rotate. Sold my buddy. Yeah, I, rotate. Uh, actually, rotate. This you're so bad at it. Um, you kind of drop her. See, look how happy she is. Oh my goodness! I know. I know. You're so pretty. Mm. It's a pretty girl. That's, that's it's a pretty girl. girl. Nova, give kiss. That's my darling. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so. Yes. 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 